How do we communicate with young adults? I've got three wonderful guests that will talk about how that's done. Clearly, we need to talk. It's important to face these realities because unless we do, we'll never know what to do next. Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt, and you're watching Truth and Life Today. It's a great joy for me to have three young men with me. I love all these three, Isaac Dagno, uh, Daniel Markin, and Joshua Scott. Uh, all three of them are working on their master's degree. Uh, Isaac Dagno has been with us at... Uh, at this ministry for quite a few years. He serves now as a lead pastor at North Valley Baptist Church in Mission, British Columbia. Daniel Markin is a young adults pastor at uh, Northview Church. And Joshua Scott has been studying and has also been serving as an intern in his local church as well. So all these three young men are going into pastoral ministry, and all three of them are gifted in knowing how to communicate with the next generation of leaders. And all three of them are working together in a ministry that's called In Doubt Ministry, which produces podcasts to speak to the young adult mind. You're going to like this. They've got a lot to say. Hi, it's great to have in studio Isaac, Joshua, and Daniel. Uh, great to have you, all three of you leaders of the Endowed Ministry. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things here today, but I know that there's an age disparity between us, and you're talking now to a group of people that are different than the group of people that were young with me. So I just wrote down a couple of things that were really issues that young people dealt with, science and creation. Um, miracles, do they occur? Can we even give a definition of miracles? The historicity of the Bible, can I believe it? Do I know it's an authentic document? The resurrection of Jesus, did it really take place? And can it be historically proven? What do we do about other religions? Are there numerous ways to God or is there only one way to God? Um, is it possible to be objective or are we just all hopelessly subjective? I mean, those are the things that we talked about. I'm gonna assume we're still having that conversation, or are we? Yeah, I'd say so. In, in some ways, that is, those are some significant conversations still happening today. But I would say that it, it almost seems as though, though those are still very real in our conversation, it almost seems as the argument today is more on the moral claims of the Bible. Uh, it leans more to the exclusivity of the scriptures, that Jesus saying, I am the way. Um, that seems to me to be the conversation I'm having the most is how can you believe that this is the only way to God? Really, I mean, sure, maybe that's true. Maybe you believe in miracles. Maybe God's real. But how can that be the only way? Seems to be the conversation that I have the most, though these scientific conversations do come up once you get past the moral argument. Uh, once you can kind of prove, well, there has to be a morality. There has to be some standard of truth. Then, that, then you come to the next wall which seems to be the, the scientific, the historical arguments. So, so would, you, would we be right in saying that the biggest barrier that prevents people from, young people from looking at the Christian faith is the barrier that says, I mean, you guys believe that your morality is just trumps everybody else's. I mean, is that the issue? Go ahead. Okay, Dan, yeah, that's yeah, a, that's yeah, a right large in. part of it is uh, in our postmodern world, the last thing you want to do is impose your beliefs onto someone else. So why would I uh, come to you and say my way is superior when we're all on our own journey? And that's the, what I've been fed. I grew up in a public school. And so that was, that was the thing. You're finding your own truth. So when we talk about truth, that is completely subjective. So it's interesting that you mentioned that ob objectivity was an issue back then. Well, it's a massive issue now, Correct. but almost non-existent. So I, when you say objective, people probably think, I don't even know what that means. Uh, because even now we, we assume subjectivity. It's just an assumption that's built in. Yeah. Well, even now with science, if you that was like the law, uh, it seems like a few generations back. What does science say about it? And then we'll we'll move from there. Now it's well, what does the law say about this thing? And we'll look at the science later. And I just think of the the movement in in how we are understanding or how the culture is viewing gender. Uh, it was well, the science says this. But now we have laws and what the mainstream culture is placing into law saying that, no, this is now what we are believing. So the objective standard is no longer science, it's the law. Isaac, want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, this idea of 
um, subjective truth being the norm now, like in the idea of like no one knows about objectivity anymore. Um, I think that's I think that's I think that's huge. I was just trying to talk to a guy yesterday. He was at our church building at 6 a.m. using our he's plugged in his iPhone just in, right near the front doors of our church and talked to him. And just even from this guy, he's the uh, 32 year old guy and just kind of living on the streets. And even just hearing from him, uh, from kind of being the low low cast, you could say, um, about you know your truth and my truth. It's just the norm. This is just it's just normal thing. And I think the idea of telling people uh, truth. Uh, from this objective standpoint is just so unusual. And I even see that that cultural understanding has seeped its way into the church where you have a lot of pastors today too that are afraid to tell people this is what you have to do. And, you know, I'm preaching through James right now and he just goes on and on about, you know, this is this is what you have to do. And it comes across as almost very offensive to our to our culture. Uh, we're used to suggesting, making recommendations, maybe if this is something you'd like to do, whereas we see a totally different... Uh, Well, I want to talk about the ministry that the three of you are doing, and you're sharing a ministry together, um, and you're talking to uh, the next generation. You're talking to young adults. I want to know about you three. I mean, when you talk about truth, I mean, are you speaking about truth as a subjective thing? What? How do you? How do you deal with this stuff? Well, I I think I think we would all be in agreement that that there is an absolutely an objective truth, and that objective truth is found in the one who is truth himself and created all things and therefore is the definer of truth, uh, that being God himself. And, and that truth is expressed in his word, um, which is the, the steadfast prophecy that we cling to. So, yeah, absolutely, there's, there's an objective truth. I mean, I just want to make sure that, that, you know, those who are listening to this have an understanding of who the three of you are. You are deeply rooted in Scripture. And I think we need to add to that, Joshua, something that uh, I'd like the three of you to talk to, and that is... You know, uh, Kelvin once said that God speaks to us as a mother speaks to her little children. That is, a mother speaks to her children in such a way that the child understands. So in other words, it's one thing to say God is objective. It's quite another thing to say we can actually understand what God is communicating. So it is possible for us, at least at some level, to gain some objective understanding of truth. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you read through the Bible, and I mean, there, there's tons of professors of the Bible that are not, are not Christians, and they can understand the Bible in many different ways, but there is that special, obviously, the, the illumination of the Spirit that's revealing to us, opening to us more uh, on a deeper level, on a spiritual level. Um, but absolutely, we can find, we can know, uh, just like a mother speaks for children, the truth of the word. Absolutely. Um, I know there's one, I had a, a youth a long time ago that just said, like, I don't understand the Bible. And I, you know, I, but I mean, I would just challenge people just to just try reading it. Just read it. Read yeah. Mark. You, you, you suggest reading Mark first. It's a short, quick understanding. Anyone can understand that. Mm-hmm. So, Well, let's talk about the kind of things that you talk about on, um, on your program. So in doubt, you do a lot of interviews. I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. And you're interviewing various people. But let's talk, before we talk about who you interview, what do you talk about? Well, we, we want to, uh, you know, look at the things that are uh, up front in people's minds today. So we will talk about maybe things like uh, sexuality, things that people are thinking about when they go into their college. So when they talk about sexuality, what kind of things are we talking about? We're talking about transgenderism. We're talking about uh, lots of different facets of, let's say, homosexuality. So attraction, um, born, or you know, natural, all these different things. We want to attack those different, not attack, so you, but... So you do talk about the whole issue of, is a person by nature homosexual? Is a person homosexual by attraction? Right. Um, is a man thinketh so is he? Is that the issue? Or yeah, So you talk about that. Right, yeah. And I think there, for a lot of people, I mean, they've just grown up with this idea that they'll just say something like homosexuality is a sin. But I think even now in terms of, you know, talking to people and having good conversations, we have to even define that even more. Are we talking about homosexual attraction and behavior? Or is this something else? And different things okay, like that. Very good. Very good. Other topics. What's in your heart? Well, I, I recorded a podcast just a couple of weeks ago that was um, uh, a gentleman down in the States had written a book about uh, nine common lies that we believe as Christians. Um, and so he was just bringing up these things that we say, like God won't give you more than you can handle uh, or, or God haven't just gained a new little angel. Uh, right? These little sayings that just come up in our, in our natural, normal conversation as we try to encourage each other. Um, but he wrote a book to say, well, actually, these are profoundly unbiblical. And because of that, they're actually harmful. Uh, The encouragement that we're trying to offer isn't encouragement that comes from the Word of God, and therefore actually bears no comfort of the Spirit with it. It's it's empty words. 
Um, and so it, we, yeah, we go from, from gender topics to just conversational things, things that just come up that we don't even, wouldn't necessarily even think about, but suddenly uh, we get the opportunity to talk about it on a podcast. Right. Daniel, what's in your heart? I mean, what kind of things are you uh, looking forward to interviewing people on? One of the things I'm looking forward to interviewing and exploring with those who will be listening to In Doubt is how we can actually understand the Bible, not as just a, a literal book, where the, and, and there are some areas where we should take this very literally, but there's also, the Bible is a literary work. And so how do we understand pieces of the Old Testament that, you know, for example, like you mentioned creation, yeah. right? Well, is it a literal seven days? Or are we talking about a polemic here where, where the writer of, of Genesis is pulling from other creation accounts and saying, hey, look, there's lots, of, um, uh, go, there's lots going on here, except it's one God who's doing it. And notice how he sets order to the chaos, where you have other um, creation accounts of other different religions or, or worldviews saying it's all chaos and the gods are fighting. You have a God in, in the Bible who's bringing order to the world, a God who creates. And so I, I want to interact with some of these ideas and show that, look, there's lots of ideas being brought to the table here, but the scriptures actually um, bring satisfying answers to all of these ideas. Okay. And, and that's one of the things on my heart is every time I've, I've looked at the Bible, I've found that there's a satisfying answer. And so to the person who is just reading the Bible for the first time, they will find answers that are deeply satisfying. And to the person who has been a Christian for 40, 50 years and is reading some real dense textbooks on the incarnation and, and things that are massive, they will also find deeply satisfying answers. And so that for me is, is finding that satisfaction that is only found Well, let me Christ. ask the three of you. I mean, you're dealing with young adults. And as you think about um, Christian evangelical young adults, um, biblical literacy, I mean, rate it for me. I mean, h how literate? Um, <laughs> okay, so, all right, you're going to put your thumb down. And, uh, and, and I think that's very easy to do. But, but tell me why you think that's true and where does that show up? I think it shows up in, first, our understanding. Um, if, if you were to ask the most common young adult, even in the church, uh, confessional orthodoxy. What does that mean to you? Uh, what is the creeds that we hold to? What, what does your denomination believe? And, and then what does the Bible say on these issues? A lot of them would struggle to probably give you a chapter and a verse. A lot of them would struggle to actually articulate, even if you pointed them to the chapter, what the Bible is actually teaching there. And I think there's not, there's a general awareness of what the scriptures are teaching, but I wouldn't say that there's, a, there's a, an intense knowledge Okay, we'll come right back on that issue, but I think we're just getting to the nub of some of the things that are very important for young adults today. It's important to face these realities because unless we do, we'll never know what to do next. We're keeping on talking about uh, the issues that young adults are facing, but I really want to get to the biblical literacy issues. I mean, we can talk about, you know, doctrinal truth of what people know, but let's talk about some of the basics of what's in the Bible. I mean, if I asked somebody, you know, who's Job, who's Abraham, who's Hezekiah, um, are these familiar figures? And if they're not, why is that? Hmm. I I don't know. I was going to say, I just don't know if a lot of young adults who claim or profess to be Christian are, are making Bible reading just an exercise in their lives. Um, they will, they will uh, have a sense of security in their faith by having a group of Christian friends going to maybe a small group or young adults group or just church on Sundays. Um, and maybe holding to some principles of loving one another and things like that and loving to listen to worship music and things like that. But are they really just doing the hard work of getting up and reading the Bible, hmm. just reading it? Uh, you know, and uh, so I, I think that's just huge. I mean, I look around today, we have just a plethora of distractions. I mean, uh, for someone to choose between reading, you know, uh, taking an hour and reading Romans or, you know, taking two hours and watching two Netflix shows on a Friday night, hmm. most are going to go over here. Um, and I think it's just a reality. I don't think people are just reading it just to understand it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, would, I would echo that. Um, 
the sense is today about Christianity is that it, it is one of many offers of spiritual life, right? It's a, it's a spirituality among others. Uh, and so the sense that I get among, among many young adults is, yeah, that we don't prioritize our Bible reading because we feel like, well, well, how would this intellectual practice of learning a book be helpful for my spirituality? Um, I, I'm enjoying being free and, and happy and joyful, and I can do what I, what I want because I'm free in the gospel and whatever, whatever that means, right? Um, but, but we're not willing to say, actually, but I, but I need to tether my, my belief in my spirituality to what is true or else it's airy-fairy and it will end in nothing. There's nothing to ground it. Um, and so I, I, think, I think biblical literacy among young adults and, and youth today is, is very low, uh, discouragingly low. Um, and and you, you mentioned names like Abraham, Moses. I, I think most will kind of know about those names, but then you mentioned Hezekiah. And I think, <laughs> I don't know many young adults who know who Hezekiah is. Right, which was certainly one of the greatest kings in Israel's Absolutely. history. You know, guys, I'm going to say that, it, that it's always a spiritual battle to read the Bible. I mean, if there's something that the enemy of our soul wants, he doesn't want us to read the Word. But there are other reasons why we don't read the Word. Why, why, why is it so hard for young adults to get their nose in the book? Well, you guys mentioned a few, but one of the ones I think about is a lot of the times in our subjective uh, understanding of the world, especially among young adults in our postmodern world, whatever language you want to use, we want to feel what we're doing. And so the Bible seems like a really uh, steep ascent of mm -hmm. intellectualism. Yeah. And when I read through books of the Bible, when I read through Leviticus or I read through some of Paul's letters, that seems like a lot of intellectual uh, task right now. And that's not going to help me feel uh, spiritual in this moment. And so it's much easier to just maybe see the little verse online and maybe that speaks to me and makes me feel. So, so the issue is people are saying, if I'm not getting a feeling immediately, yeah. I'm reading through Leviticus, I don't get a feeling. So I, mean, I don't understand the benefit of that. Josh? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think... I think there's two significant things that we're missing today in terms of our understanding of what it is to be a Christian. And one is that this is a very doctrinal faith. This, there's, we're saying what we say based on the truth claims of Scripture. Uh, and those truth claims stand fast through circumstances that are going to blow our feelings in every which way. Uh, things are going to happen in our lives, and they will. Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this life. Uh, that's true. And why, why do we know that's true? Well, because the Scriptures teach us that. Uh, there are going to be moments in our lives where we're going to be discouraged and we're going to feel like we're beaten down to the dust, but the truth of the Word of God is going to stand fast. The truth of God's promises are going to stand fast. But I think the other thing, apart from just the intellectual, doctrinal uh, confession that is Christianity, I think we're missing today a, a significant understanding of the new birth in the life of a Christian. Um, that to be a Christian isn't simply that I affirm these doctrines. It isn't simply that I read my Bible. It's actually that God has worked a miracle of spiritual life in me. Yeah. And so though there isn't this feeling sense of I come to the scriptures always just wanting this feeling, at the same time, the radical work of God is that he has made me alive. Yeah, he's given me a new heart. He's it's, given me the absolutely. Holy Spirit. I have a desire that I never had before. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, I, I, I'm going to kind of draw this together because I, I want you each to think about in doubt, I think it's great ministry, but you tell me why it's a great ministry. Why should a young adult be watching or listening to In Doubt podcasts? I think, you know, I was thinking about this, and some mornings I wake up, and I just don't want to do life. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to, I, obviously, none of you guys face that, but <laughs> I do. Sometimes I just wake up, and I'm just not feeling it at all, uh, speaking of feelings. And it's amazing. This, at least for me, and I'm sure other young adults feel the same way, and, and a lot of different people do. It only takes maybe 10 seconds of being in a conversation with someone who loves the Bible or loves Jesus or loves the gospel just to completely change my, change my heart. And so I'm it's just, a podcast that I, doesn't take any effort just to listen to. Exactly. So that's my it point. it be, begins to engage. It, it begins to inspire people to say, wow, here's a conversation about something that my heart just longs for. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited now. So it just, it, it just changes. Yeah, Joshua? Good. Yeah, I, I would only add to that that I find it so helpful uh, to, to listen along and to talk along with, with godly people about how do I think about these things that are going on in my world, in my life, through a biblical lens? Like, is there even something to be said about this through 
uh, the scriptures? Do the scriptures speak about something that's going on in my life? I find it so helpful for me to sit down. I have a few mentors in my life and I'll say, man, this is going on. And suddenly they'll start quoting Christ in a parable. And I'll realize, how did I not see that before? That this actually comes right to my life. This is very real and the scriptures speak to it. So uh, being able to listen along and get my mind engaged into discerning uh, through the word of God, uh, what's going on in my life, what's going on in the lives of my friends. I I find that personally helpful. So uh, I hope that other young adults would find the podcast helpful in the same way. Last word, Dan. Yeah, I would say that uh, we should be listening to podcasts in general because they're just, they're another way of passively learning. And so I have spent a lot of time listening to podcasts while I do the dishes, while I get ready in the morning. And uh, as I'm getting ready, right, uh, being able to listen in on a conversation about the Lord. And if this is the, uh, if if you follow Jesus and you love him, uh, even if you're not feeling it that morning, just even having uh, this like podcast going and just passively entering into your mind is going to transform you in ways that you don't understand. Thank you. Uh, All three of you, and uh, as you continue to do this week after week, um, and as you're looking for relevant issues that young adults face, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your impact in lives. God bless you. You know, I'm calling this After Hours because we finished our interview, but there's still stuff that we need to talk about. And uh, one of the things that uh, we started to say is that there is a high degree of fear that goes on, especially among a new generation, probably because I think we've got more social media. We're hearing more things. But uh, you also mentioned, Daniel, that, you know, helicopter parents. Actually, I hadn't heard that expression. Yeah. But I get it. Hovering overhead, constantly worried that everything could be wrong. And it's created that, that, that fear that l- lacking freedom to just express oneself. Yeah, the idea of, of a helicopter and a parent always being over the child, being like, don't touch that, don't get hurt, uh, don't stay out too late because there's all these terrible bad things that are happening out in the world. And one of the things we're talking about was motorcycles. A lot of people in our generation aren't riding motorcycles because of that fear. Well, what if I fall? And what if I, like, what if I fall and break my leg? Then I can't work, then I can't do these things. And, and it's so dangerous. Why would I want to put myself into danger? And uh, I think a lot of that has been through how our generation has been raised, where they, we, and that's, is that the news, is that social media, is that always just being aware of how bad our world is and parents are clamping down? Mm-hmm. I don't know uh, all the answers yeah. to that. No, I, I, there's, I think there's lots of different aspects that fit into it. I think one of them is, uh, we were talking about this before, just a low view of uh, God's will, yeah. God's providential, sovereign will. And if we're being raised by parents that are, you know, when we're young, they're telling us that they're kind of in control. And then they tell us, you got to take control of your own life and you got to do your own thing. Then we're going to be, you know, like, like it is in James, like we're going to be planning our own routes. We're going to be like, we're going to go over there. We're going to go to college. We're going to do this. Um, but that's not the way we're, we're to live because uh, we need to be kind of obviously always having that, you know, if God wills, because God will do anything. He'll, I, one of my favorite uh, passages in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he says that, you know, we were in um, Asia and we thought we were going to, we thought we were going to die. Yeah. Uh, so it was so much affliction. We thought mm-hmm. we were going to die. Mm-hmm. But that was only uh, so that God would, you know, teach us that we have to rely on him mm-hmm. and not ourselves. And I think that's just a huge truth that we need to, uh, to recognize today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not in control of our lives. That's huge, yeah. you know? Yeah. But that said, God also gives us wisdom not to Absolutely. make stupid choices. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like you read the Bible and it's, it's a book of wisdom so that we aren't just like, well, I will survive this jump. Right. For sure. Well, you might not. And it's probably you should uh, use some wisdom there. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, wisdom is, is living skillfully. Um, but, you know, there's an old saying that life is what happens while we're making other plans. <laughs> um, and the reality is... Um, that plans of God will supersede our plans. So the real question, and Isaac, you mentioned that, you know, you're going to be disappointed if you think that your plans are going to reach every, you know, this is how I've planned it, this is what I deserve now because I've planned it and I've done these things, so why didn't this outcome happen? Man, I'm even mad at God because of this, rather than saying, you know, my life has been in his hands and, oh, Lord, direct my life as you want and as you see fit. I, I, I think often about the, the first question of the Westminster Confession, right? right? The, what is the chief end of man? Uh, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, and the creation around us, uh, all things were created for our enjoyment, right? 
Uh, we get to enjoy the life. We can enjoy the lakes and we get to enjoy the, the highways and the sunshine. Um, we enjoy it, but not simply for our own pleasure. It's not just so that we get whatever we want out of whatever we want, but, but it's that met with and to the glory of God, right? My life now, by, because of the redemptive work of Christ, is I get to enjoy a reconciled relationship with God, which means that now my relationship with creation is, is different because I now see it in view of my relationship with God. Um, and so there's, there's the wisdom that we carry, uh, but there's the freedom of the gospel that is uh, go out and enjoy your life to the glory of God and the purposes of God, um, trusting that, that when the day comes, um, your day will come. It will come. <laughs> it, will, it, will come. it will come. Exactly, right? <laughs> yes, it does. I mean, and, and the, the entrusting ourselves to God says, you know, the things that God directs to come towards my life he directs those things that are for my long-term good and for his glory. And I'm not always sure what that is. Uh, and good, plan your life. Do what you think you should do. Um, but in the end of the day, if God changes all those plans, give him glory because he is the one who ultimately authors the experiences that you will have. Yeah. When he gives you the things that you would have asked for had you known what he knows. <laughs> right? So, man, had you but known. Had yeah, you absolutely. known. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I think to Paul, Paul and Timothy and Silas, uh, in I think chapter 16 or 15 in Acts, you know, they tried to go over here, mm-hmm. Pontus or whatever, Holy Spirit stopped them. They tried to go over here, Holy Spirit stopped them, and then That's it right. led them to Macedonia where they Macedonia, had to go. Macedonia, the man of Macedonia came, come over here. Come over here. You would never have gone to exactly. Greece, ever. The gospel wouldn't have come yes. to Europe if God hadn't interrupted him. And yet these are closed doors. Uh, to Paul, and it didn't just discourage him. I think a lot of people just get discouraged when they try to do something, and it's like, and like, okay, I'll just wait. It's like you're so waiting. So the word to the next generation: just turn left or right. <laughs> go do something. Yes. God will direct <laughs> you. Absolutely. Yes. Don't be afraid. Yes. Go forward with boldness. Yeah. Great. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful year. Truth and life, uh, and uh, and of course, uh, in doubt ministry, the thing that you're doing. Um, may the Lord give many more that listen and whose lives are changed. Cool. Thanks. Tom. It's important to face these realities because unless we do, we'll never know what to do next. You know, it's been said that, you know, Christianity is uh, always one generation from extinction. Well, of course, the promises of God being what they are, that's actually not true. But it is true that every single generation has to engage the faith afresh. Some of those wonderful truths. God is one. God is triune. God is all-knowing. And the attributes of God have been shared with us through his word. The Bible is a historical document that can be trusted and should be digested. It is true that we are sinners and Christ came to save us from our sins. It is also true that We are awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have received a new nature when we've been born again. I mean, all of these truths that are found in the scripture are not just eternal truths. They have to be grasped by a new generation. And so what you've been watching is three young men who are looking for and grasping at how to make those truths known to a new generation of young adults. And I hope that if you're a young adult, you'll listen. And I also hope that if you're not, you'll tell somebody, maybe it's a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter, to to key in on in-doubt ministry. And I think you're going to be glad that they did. But nonetheless, let's commit ourselves to this. The next generation has to be reached in the name of Jesus. Let's do it and let's also commit ourselves to this. God is able to help us to make this a wonderful, wonderful success. Uh, Thanks for joining us today, and please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interviews, episodes, and Bible teaching content. Uh, Thanks for joining us today.